to start by having you think about what is your biggest challenge. And this varies greatly from person to person. So people kind of think first things like public speaking or job interviews, but it could be something completely different. So maybe it's taking a test, maybe it's, um, maybe it's having, you know, dealing with conflict with somebody that you love. So think about a situation that is characterized in this way. You approach it with a sense of fear, you execute it with anxiety and distraction, and you leave it with regret, wanting a do-over, feeling like you haven't been seen, feeling like if only I had said this. So it's not so much about uh, the concrete outcome, did you get the job or not, it's about how you feel when you left. And you know, when I first started doing this work, I really was focused on concrete outcomes. You know, I was teaching MBA students, and they're supposed to speak in class. 50% of their grade is participation. And so I just wanted to get the ones who weren't speaking to speak, because I knew they were smart, but they were afraid. And, uh, and, and I wanted the people who were interviewing for jobs to get the jobs. I wasn't thinking about how they would feel when they left those situations. And one of the things that I've learned is that people can accept an outcome if they feel like they've shown people who they are, if they feel that they were seen, if they feel understood. I'm not sure what's the be where's the best place to stand. I can see people trying to see over here. So uh, I'm going to stand a little, hmm, maybe I'll stand back here. So that's what I'm talking about. And, you know, I don't want people to go through life with that feeling that they didn't put everything out there. I want them to go through life feeling like they did everything they could and they feel understood. But when you think about it this way, these big challenges tend to make us absent in every stage. As we approach them, we're borrowing trouble from a future that hasn't yet unfolded. While we're there, we're not actually listening to what's happening or being said. We're worrying about what we think they might be thinking of us and what that will mean for the future and what we should have said a minute ago. We're not there. We're totally distracted. And when we leave, we're kind of backwards projecting ourselves into a situation that we can't change. It's over. Uh, so, so you're not present. So what if you approach those situations with excitement? So let me tell you a brief story. So this is Fatane. Fatane works at one of my favorite uh, bookstores in Boston, which is also called The Trident. Uh, and I know you've got a Trident here. Um, and the Trident has a, a counter, a kind of diner in it. And I was working there, I write often, in, in bookstore cafes. And I wasn't looking, I was working on this computer here, and she came to serve me coffee, and she stopped. I could see that she had paused in front of me, and she said, I just want you to know that your talk really changed my life. And you know, I hadn't introduced myself, but she had recognized me, and, and I was actually working on the introduction of the book. Now, she, if you've read the book, and I know most of you haven't, but Patane does show up on the very first page of the book now as a result of this. And I said, tell me more about, about that. You know, how did it affect you? And she said, well, I, I grew up in Texas, but I'm from Iran, and I always felt like an outsider there. And, uh, and then you know, I sort of started closing up. And I, I didn't know what to do, so I ended up moving to Boston. And you know, now I'm working here. But, but I, I really wanted to go to medical school, but I was terrified to take the MCAT. Even though she had great grades and had every reason to believe that she would do well, she felt that she was so scared of that experience that she knew that when she got in the room, she would not be able to access the knowledge to get it out. And so she saw my talk, and she decided, I'm doing this. Like, why, why not? Everyone feels like an imposter. At least this woman who I just saw talking at TED feels like an imposter. I'm going to try this. I'm going to take the MCAT. So she said, I stood in the bathroom for two minutes like Wonder Woman, and we'll get to that later, why she did that. And she said, and I took the MCAT, and I completely nailed it. And I was able to access all of this knowledge. And this is why I love this story. She did fake it. She tricked herself into feeling confident enough to unlock that, that part of herself. It's not like power posing gave her some knowledge of stem cells, right? She, she had that. She just wasn't able to access it earlier. So when she finally took the MCAT, she approached it more with composure. She executed it with calm confidence. And she left it feeling satisfied. So she was actually present. And that's why she was able to do this well. Presence reveals itself in a, in a few ways. So when people actually are present, when they're speaking and they're present and they're, they're happy to be there, 
there are three things that come across. The first is that they believe their story. They know their story and they believe it and you can tell they believe it. If you talk to venture capitalists and say, I like this, this thought exercise for them. Say you have five equally good ideas and you're gonna decide who to invest in based on the pitch. What are you looking for? You, say, you know other bias about these products or ideas. This is what they say in some way or another. If that person doesn't buy their story, there's no way I'm buying it. So if, they, if I can tell for a second that they wouldn't buy the product they're selling me, there's no way I would buy it, right? There's something about that believing your story that communicates to other people that they can believe it, right? Why would they trust you if you clearly don't trust yourself? So that's the first thing that happens. The second is that we convey confidence without arrogance, because arrogance is really just a smokescreen for insecurity. You know, it's a wall that people put up. It's a wall that they put up because they don't want to be challenged. Or it's a wall, wall that they put up because they actually do want to fight, but not in a constructive way. But it's not the same as confidence. When people feel present, they are comfortable with themselves and they can be open to the possibility that they're wrong, to improving this thing that they care about, right? So that's another quality that you look for. And the last is a little more sort of sciency but fun. And it's that when we're being authentic and present, our verbal behavior matches our nonverbal behavior. So we're actually communicating in a way that's fluid. When we're lying or being inauthentic, all of a sudden that stuff is asynchronized. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not moving in concert. Great research by a woman named Nancy Etcoff at Harvard who studied you know, lie detection. And if, you, if I asked you, what's the cue that you're looking for to know if people are lying? I, I can tell you that 72% of you would say eye contact. And that's true in 60 countries around the world. That's what people think. It turns out across people, it's a terrible predictor because there are huge personality differences that determine whether or not someone's gonna make eye contact while they're being challenged. And there are huge cultural differences. Some people learn that you don't make eye contact with somebody who's questioning you. So eye contact is a terrible predictor. What's a great predictor is asynchrony across the nonverbal channels. So if I'm telling you a happy story, my body language should be happy. My body language shouldn't be fearful. If I'm telling you a sad story, my body language shouldn't be agitated. But when we're trying to tell something that we don't believe, we can't choreograph all these separate pieces. We're telling a story while suppressing another one, dealing with the conflict in our brains and trying to look compelling at the same time. We can't do all those things. We don't have the cognitive bandwidth. So when we're being authentic, it just all falls into line. We might be awkward because that's maybe how we are, but, but, but it's consistent. And, and so really what happens is that when you're present, you, you sort of, you know, you're getting out of the way of yourself so that you can be yourself. And so everything becomes harmonious, and you can see that in pe people's presentations. So how do we become present? Well, one of the people that I interviewed for the book, uh, it, so I interviewed a kind of combination of researchers and people who I think are great practitioners of presence, is Julianne Moore, who, you know, if you talk to directors who've worked with her, they'll say she's the most present actor they've ever worked with. She can really, you know, get to the set, be there completely, and then leave and go home and, and leave that behind. So I met her uh, at a dinner and, and we started talking about this and I thought I have to know more about this because one of the th interesting things about people who are experts is that they're often very poor at explaining how they do what they do, right? Because it's easy for them. She's not like this because she worked to do this. She understands the process of doing this. And so she said, it's really all about power. And I said, you, like, you know, power, power over people? And she said, no. Although, you know, when you are in a position of power, it's easier to be present because people kind of allow you to be. They kind of part and allow you to be, and they're constantly validating this positive impression or this sort of positive idea of yourself. But she said it's like personal power. It's, it's this power to access who you are. And she said, when I'm working with a young actor who can't show up, you know, they're there, but they're not there, you can't make a scene work if pe both people aren't present. So she, I said, well, what do you do? And, and Bill and I will get more to this later because I know this will be one of his favorites. She said, I ask them questions and listen. I just ask them about themselves. As long as it takes until they feel that I understand them 
and they feel comfortable and they feel that they belong there, she said, because then they feel powerful. They feel that they can bring their best self forward. So I think this is interesting because presence is a word that's soft and people kind of don't like it sometimes because they think it's too soft and it's about, you know, going to, and again, nothing wrong with month-long yoga retreats, but they have this idea that you have to be able to do that or have a pilgrimage around the world or something to become present. And I think that's too bad if, that they think that. I think, again, if you can do that, great, but we all can find ways to be present in these moments in our lives. Power repels people for a different reason. It's a prickly word. Because if I, if I did a sort of, you know, free word association with you and asked you what words do you think of when you think of power, a lot of you would say corruption or corrupt. And that's too bad, I think, because most power doesn't corrupt. Social power can corrupt, and the examples that we think of are the salient ones where it did corrupt. So we think of the people whose personalities interacted with having power and led to corruption. But when we feel personally powerful, that doesn't corrupt us. In fact, my favorite quote about power, power is from Robert Caro, who was LBJ's biographer, and said, when somebody asked him, so you know, you've, you've studied presidents, does power corrupt? And he said, power does not corrupt, but power always reveals. And I thought, that, that's right, right? Power allows us to be who we are. Well, sometimes that's not good, but personal power really allows us to bring our best selves forward. So I like this idea of presence and power, and, but I wanna be clear again, social power is power over other people, power over their access to necessary resources. You control, you've got the key to the things that they need, and they can't get them without you. Personal power is having the key to the resources that you possess within yourself. So for Fatane, it was having the key to unlock her knowledge of stem cells and other things that are on the MCAT exam. Um, that's personal power. So personal power is infinite. Social power is zero sum. They're very different. We want people to have personal power. It doesn't take it away from us. So power in the psychology literature, and I could go through lots and lots of findings, but when people feel powerful, when they're made to feel powerful in the lab, what we find is that it activates the behavioral approach system. So it makes people see challenges not as threats but as opportunities. They approach instead of avoid. They feel confident and optimistic. They, they, they want to do things. So the sort of shorthand is that it, it leads you to, to go, to act, and to do so with positivity. Powerlessness does the exact opposite. It activates the behavioral inhibition system and it leads people to see these challenges as threats. It basically puts you in these challenging situations into the frightened animal situation, which isn't really adaptive because most situations don't involve a predator chasing you, right? Most of these stressful situations are stressful because they have a social evaluative component. You're afraid of being judged. You're not really gonna be attacked by a tiger, but you might feel that way. Powerlessness leads us to avoid and withdraw and to be cynical and negative, right? So, and it makes us hold back who we really are. It, it makes us put forth a sort of constrained, socially constrained version of ourselves. So power does lead to presence. Before we move on, and again, I know some of you have seen the talk, and Boulder people do seem to have great posture because of all of the yoga, which is, again, good. And I do talk about the many benefits of yoga in the book. But do check your posture. I just want you to pay attention to how you're sitting now because this is sort of your default sitting position. And we spend a lot of time sitting down, listening, not thinking about our body language because we're not putting on a show, right? So we're not thinking about what we're communicating to others. But it's pretty clear that, that your body is always in conversation with your mind. Always, even when you're not paying attention, it's giving you feedback about what the situation is and what you should be doing. So pay attention to how much you're slouching, pulling your shoulders forward, collapsing your chest, maybe wrapping up your body, you know, twisting your legs versus spreading out and taking up your allowed amount of space, like hopefully not taking up other people's space. But that's what I want you to pay attention to because that kind of expansion or contraction is really the dimension of body language that I think is most relevant to power and to presence. And if you, you look at the, the animal literature, you will see that animals do the same thing as humans. So when animals have power, when they have status, they expand, they make themselves big, they take up a lot of space, they even will occupy higher places on the ground. Um, 
chimps will pick up sticks to make themselves look bigger. They'll stretch them out like this. You know, the pounding of the chest is something that actually happens. They even, their hair will stand on end. So all of these things are expansive, making them look bigger. Other animals do the same thing. When they're trying to show who's dominant, who's in charge, they stand on their hind legs. They make themselves as big as possible. Uh, here, you know, beautiful example, if you've ever seen a peacock, raise and, and, and fan its feathers, it's really, it's, it's a powerful display. And humans do the same thing. Uh, and um, this is my husband, and uh, th this is how we met. So he, he, he actually lived in Australia, and he posted this picture on Facebook. And uh, you might think, kind of, wow, I'm not sure about this guy. He's a sweetheart, he's a gentle giant, but I was so intrigued by this picture, picture and it turned out his sister worked for my friend that we ended up meeting and, and uh, getting married eventually. So now he's here, somewhere in the crowd. You might spot him, but he's not sitting like this anymore. Uh, but it did work in that case. Uh, so anyway, when people feel powerful, they do the same thing. So I wanna spend a little while on this pose. So this is the victory pose. So gymnasts do this before and after routines because it signals victory. And in fact, it, it's true around the world. So Jessica Tracy has studied this particular pose in dozens of cultures. She has not yet found a culture where people do not do this when they win first place. If she shows them pictures of people in that position and says, what emotion are they feeling? They'll say, pride, confidence, power. Those, those are the, the emotions that are associated with this. So I'm gonna quickly run you through a whole bunch of pictures of people winning first place. This guy, by the way, 100 years old, World War II vet, won a 5K in his age group. And so people were like, oh, well, in his age group. But the age group was like 60 to 100. You know? So I would say he, he definitely nailed it. Uh, all over the world, even Boston. <laughs> this was a better year for Boston. And, uh, and, and so this is David Ortiz running the bases during a, a home run. And at the same time, this is happening. So this is at Fenway Park. This is a Boston police officer and an outfielder from the other team trying to catch the ball and possibly injuring his brain, but the police officer is feeling powerful vicariously because his team is winning. So we do this even when our team and our kin are doing well. And here's a whole stadium of people doing that. Uh, here's a very recent one that some of you <laughs> probably identify with. Uh, and I'm even okay with that, even though they beat the Broncos. Uh, so let's just pause on this one for a minute. So this guy is a super athlete, super power poser as well. And, uh, and think about this for a minute. So he, this is Usain Bolt. He's just run 100 meters faster than any human in the history of the world. Why would you run around prancing and wasting energy after doing something like that. You should want to go into the fetal position and get an IV drip or something, right? You should not want to do this. I mean, if you were thinking of, a, of sort of human needs from a really basic primary needs perspective, this wouldn't make sense. But the fact that this shows up in every culture tells us that there's a real strong link between winning and feeling powerful and showing others that you have power. Even if it's fleeting, you're gonna show people that you have power. If that's not convincing enough, this should convince you that it's a hardwired connection. Even congenitally blind people do the same thing. So people who have never seen anyone else do this, when they win first place, they throw their arms in the air, they tend to lift their chins and open their mouths. Same thing. It's very expansive, it's very open. Some other examples of powerful posture. I couldn't help but include this one. Uh, so here are the sort of iconic American superheroes. Here's a more sinister one. This is our parents' generation of power poses. This is what happens when you get the most power, regardless of who you are. So the feet up on the desk, not necessarily the best pose for a boss when he's meeting with employees, but you know, I guess when you become president, you feel pretty comfortable stretching out like that. I love this one because she's sort of like, I've got the whole Alps behind me. Um, but but let's, let's pause on this one for a minute because it's not as dramatic. So here she's got her fingers spread and this is called steepling. And it's not a natural pose, right? It's not that we walk around with our hands like this. 
But we do this as we feel more confident. We start to spread our fingers apart. So even that, even though it's subtle, it's associated with feeling confident. You can even watch, if you're watching a, a, somebody give a, giving a public speak when they're not holding a mic and they can hold their hands together, you will see as the energy rises, they might start to spread the fingers apart. As they start to get nervous, you see them pulling the fingers together and contracting. So that, that's, that's a, a, you know, a, a more, very subtle example, although my son pointed out that it's good to be careful with that one. So at least, I mean, he, I showed him the, 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 the other picture, and he was like, oh, no, 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 people should not do that. So uh, beautiful example, Alvin Alley Dance Theater. So, I used to be a professional ballet dancer. I actually danced with Colorado Ballet. And um, we did all of the classical ballets. And in the classical ballets, the female protagonist is dainty and fragile and either dead or half dead. And if she's not already dead, by, by the end she is, because she's all crumpled up on the floor. Unless she's the evil alter ego, then she gets to have the bigger poses. But in Alvin Alley Dance Theater, which is contemporary in so many of the ballets, are about liberation and freedom from oppression, you see this kind of body language, which is so beautifully expansive. Uh, this is Cambodian dance. So I just taught in Cambodia for a couple of weeks and was just really fascinated with the culture. And this is you know, quite subtle, but in Cambodian dance, this is the strongest position, the most open position. And what it represents is a plant, a flower, or a tree growing and blossoming. And so I think that's a really beautiful example as well. Now we'll pause on this one for a minute. Anyone from New Zealand? OK. So um, you might recognize these guys. So this is the New Zealand rugby team. They're called the All Blacks. And, uh, and they are the best rugby team in the world. So what they do before each rugby match is something called a haka. Haka is a, a Maori dance. So it's, it's part of the indigenous culture of New Zealand. And it's, it's part of mainstream culture, which I think is, by the way, you know, really says something about New Zealand. They, they're doing a lot of things right. Uh, but what happens is before, before a match, they go through this series of very powerful postures, this slow, deep chant as they slowly approach the other team. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. Uh, and I'll hold the mic up because I, I think we don't have audio. I'm not sure if we have audio plugged in. But as you watch, I want you to just, I want to see your reaction as you watch it, and then we'll, we'll briefly debrief. It's pretty dramatic. Guess who won? <laughs> they usually win, actually. Uh, so when I first saw this, and somebody showed it to me because they were like, oh, you, you have to see this if you study powerful posture, I thought it was so over the top. I thought it was so masculine, and it was sort of like doing a dance in the end zone. It's not at all about that. I then learned more about it. And haka, first of all, is not a war dance, although people mistakenly think it is. It's actually done at funerals. It's done as a show of respect and reverence. And when you talk to these guys, who are not people who would do dances in the end zone, they take it so seriously. They get choked up talking about They grew up practicing the haka, wanting to do this. And they say it's not about intimidating the other side. It's preparing ourselves. 
making ourselves strong, connected with the ground, connected with the stadium, connected with each other, finding our collective, collective strength. The fact that it's intimidating probably doesn't hurt, but they're actually finding now that when they do the haka outside the stadium or in private, they do even better in the match. Right? So they're preparing themselves, and that's what that's really about. And by the way, the tongue sticking out uh, and the, the wide eyes is called the pukana, and that is, uh, that's, they say, that's the, that's the sort of um, bring it on sign. That's the most extreme thing. And it might look crazy, but think of it. It's totally expansive and vulnerable. You're basically making yourself completely vulnerable. So, so really amazing show of strength. This is another, uh, another sports example. So this is a great predictor. This kind of uh, posture before a penalty shootout is a great predictor of the quality of the kick. Uh, if you see um, somebody coming up and about to kick and they're kind of moving around and, and, um, and, and you know, shifting and, and, and racing, the quality of the kick is likely to be much worse. And when I say quality, I mean on a continuum. It's not just did you get the shot or not, because there are, there are non-shots that are good kicks, you know, but you just had a really good keeper. So this is a very good predictor of a, of a good kick. Uh, this is what happens when you lose. And, um, I think, you know, being out here, like we can all feel okay about it being the Yankees as the example, but, but so you start to contract and make yourself smaller, you start to touch your head and your face and basically protect yourself from a predator, right? You're making yourself small and you're making yourself invisible. This is what happens when our team is not doing well. We start to cover our faces and our eyes. Turns out second uh, silver medalist in the Olympics. Uh, feel very powerless uh, compared to the other medalists. In fact, bronze medalists are much happier. Good research on this because they're comparing downward to, you know, the six billion people who they beat. The gold medalist has, you know, no, no upward comparison to make, but the silver medalist is focusing only on the one person in the world that he or she didn't beat. So you see much more closed body language. So watch the podium next Olympics and watch the silver medalist because you will see things like this. And now, I have to say, I feel a little torn about using this because she actually has such a good sense of humor about this moment, and I really appreciate that about her, so she can laugh at, laugh, laugh at that moment. Uh, but animals do the same thing. They wrap themselves up when they're at the bottom. Uh, dogs pull their tails between their legs, and in fact, the tail between the legs is actually correlated with a cortisol spike in dogs. So when they're doing this, they are definitely feeling more stressed out and anxious. This is how they show submissiveness. Cats do the same thing. So you see all of the same behavior in animals as you see in humans. When they feel powerless, they want to hide and be invisible because they don't want to be hurt and they don't want to offend the one who's at the top of the hierarchy. So when we feel powerful, we expand. And when we feel powerless, we shrink. Even our speech, when we feel powerful, we speak more slowly and we take more pauses. So we take up more temporal space. I can see when I'm listening to my students in class, when they're feeling powerless, they speak so fast, they truncate their comments, they don't say everything that they wanted to say. But if you ask them, they say they felt that they were speaking so slowly because they were so anxious, they felt that it was dragging on, but they were actually speaking way too quickly for anyone to process what they were saying. So there's even research showing that if you get people to slow down their speech, they will feel more powerful. So just slow down. So if you're in a public speaking situation where you're feeling anxious, First of all, if you start to kind of collapse, make yourself open up, but also slow your speech. Take pauses. Pauses are empty spaces and they're scary, but they're actually really powerful as well because they allow people to process what you're saying. You get to collect your thoughts. Everyone's looking at, at you when you take a pause, so don't be afraid to do that. It will make you feel better. So remember that biggest challenge. How did you feel before you went into it? Did you, uh, did you, you know, walk around like Usain Bolt, or did you do something more like this? Because if you look up the stock images uh, for job interview waiting room, this is what you find. And that's not really how you want to be sitting before you go into a job interview. It's polite, but it's putting you into a powerless position. So it's making you feel powerless before you even go in. So we wanted to know what happens if you, in private, do this before you go in in your own office, or again, in a bathroom stall, or an elevator, or the stairwell, or wherever you can find privacy. What if you do something like this before you walk in? Uh, that's what we wanted to know. So I'm just gonna summarize the experiments because I, if you wanna know more about this stuff, you can watch the TED Talk, and it's also in the book. But I'll, I'll give you a quick summary, and this is what we wanted to know. Can power, can power posing help us 
become more powerful and more present before we actually go in. So we had people adopt either poses like this, which are high power poses, or poses like this, which are low power poses. And you can see they're not super dramatic, right? These are poses that you see people sitting in all the time. So they did this in a room alone for two minutes, and then we measured a lot, uh, um, different variables in different studies. There are now about 35 studies that have looked at this in, in uh, different lengths of time. By the way, two minutes is not a magic number. And I said it so many times in the TED talk that it became very sticky, but it can be shorter than this. And in fact, we're finding that longer is worse because people start to get really uncomfortable. There's a study that recently had people hold a pose for six minutes, one pose, and they didn't find it, that some of the effects that we found. They found some, but not others. Like, it's way too long. People felt so uncomfortable standing like this for six minutes, right? So shorter is, is better than longer. This is what one of the things that we looked at, testosterone and cortisol, because I know it's hard to see. Testosterone is the dominance and assertiveness hormone, and it's associated with behaviors like risk tolerance and willingness to compete. Cortisol is the opposite. It's the stress hormone. It's related to stress and anxiety and insecurity and fear. And what we find in both the human and non-human primate world is that the people at the top tend to have relatively high testosterone and low cortisol. That's true for men and women within gender. And in, in addition to that, they are viewed as better leaders by the people who work for them. So not only are they likely to have more power, but they are better leaders. And when you look at the surveys, uh, the questions that are asked about whether they're good leaders, they're not like, is this person strong and decisive? The questions are, does this person care about you? Do they, do they take the best interests of the team to heart? Do they want to do, do, you know, do they give you feedback in a constructive way? So these people are strong, but they're also calm and not stress reactive and not afraid of feedback that's negative and they can weather a crisis. So they're sort of happy warriors. These are the kind of people that we want to work for. A high, a high testosterone, high cortisol boss, less pleasant, right? So then you have, you sort of competitive but also stress reactive and not, not very, very pleasant. So we wanted to know, is it, could, we, could we find changes in these hormones? And what we found was two minutes in the pose and you get a 20% increase in testosterone for the high power posers and a 10% decrease for the low power posers. This is also, let me say, a, a majority female sample in this study. And, uh, and cortisol does exactly the opposite. So what's happening is just adopting these poses that's telling your brain that you've won, right? So what's, it's, it's actually changing your circulating levels of these hormones such that you feel you have power. Uh, another, I think, really wonderful study that looked at this, looked at this pose, which is the cobra. And I like this study because this is actually, this is a little bit of an uncomfortable pose to hold, but it's very dominant and expansive. They also looked at blood serum levels, which is more conservative. And they had, so they had people ho hold this pose for two to three minutes, and they found exactly the same thing. So they found a 16% increase in testosterone, 11% decrease in cortisol, and that, that that pattern emerged in every single participant in the study. Of course, the effect sizes weren't identical, but I have never done a study where every participant shows the effect that I've predicted. So there's something that's going on there with these expansive postures. But others who have studied this have found now that when you hold these poses before a test, you're, you, you do better on the test, you're better at abstract thinking, you become more creative. Kids, when they're taught to sit up straight in school, I know it sounds so old fashioned, they're more productive. They do better in creative writing tests, which I think is interesting because creative, creative writing is so much about expressing the self. Uh, it even increases people's pain threshold. So in these studies, people, I, not done by us, but done by a, a couple of researchers in Toronto, they, they had them hold you know, simple power poses or just neutral poses. And the people who held the power poses were able to tolerate more pain and, and rated the painful experience as much less painful than the people who just stood in the normal, normal postures. So it's somehow strengthening us in that way as well. And then in our own research, we've looked at things like job interviews and we find that people who power pose before do much better. People want to hire those people. So we have trained evaluators judge these videos of the job interviews knowing nothing about the hypothesis and knowing nothing about the conditions, and still they want to hire the high power posers and not the low power posers, but why? What's going on? 
What's, what's not going on is they're not, saying, they're not saying different things. So the content of what they say is the same. It's not that the high power posers are delivering a different message, but they're delivering it in a different way. And we code the videos for those qualities of presence that I talked about earlier, and that's exactly what we find. The people who've done the high power poses for a couple of minutes uh, were more believable, they showed more confidence, but without arrogance, and they communicated fluidly and harmoniously, so they were present. They were able to be there instead of being terrified by the experience. Uh, so expansive posture does the same thing as power. It makes you act and approach and see these challenges as opportunities instead of threats, and it makes you feel more confident and positive and optimistic. Uh, but it's not just about these big power poses. It's also about, as I implied earlier, just your general posture. So look at this. This is, this is a sketch of uh, the difference between uh, the posture of someone who is not depressed, I, although I have to say, I'm going to argue in a minute that most of us do not sit like this anymore. Uh, and this is, this is a posture that's associated with clinical depression. So people start to feel powerless and slump and make themselves small. First, clinical psychologists started to show that if you get people with depression to sit upright, they become more positive, their symptoms of depression reduce, and they even show what they call a positive memory bias, which means they remember more positive things from their past and more positive things about themselves. But it's not just for people with depression. Just taking people from the general population, you find the exact same thing. Simply sitting upright makes people feel happier, more optimistic, more confident. So this is a little troubling because this is affecting our posture. Think of how much time we spend on our phone. Right? Even if we're active people who think we're sitting up straight all the time, the phone doesn't distract us just because it's taking us away from the content of what's happening. It distracts us also because it puts us into that slumped, powerless pose. So we decided to, uh, to yeah, this was before a talk that I was giving and everybody was on their phone. So uh, to have people work for five minutes on one of these devices, and, and they, you can see they're increasingly expansive. And, and of course, we looked at whether the body language matched, and it did. So the bigger the device, the more open your shoulders, the farther apart your, your hands are, the, the more expansive your body language. Five minutes doing simple tasks on one of these devices. We then come in and say, I need to take that device from you because I'm going to give it, I need to give it to the next person, but I'll be back in five minutes to debrief you, and I don't want to waste your time. So if I don't come back in five minutes, please come get me. Giant clock is on the wall, that, and they point to it and say, exactly at this time, come get me. So then they're sitting there in a room alone with nothing, because we've also confiscated their phone. They're just sitting there, and it turns out the bigger the device, the more likely people are to come out later and say, hey, I'm waiting. The more likely they are to be assertive and feel like, hey, my time is, is, is worth something and you told me to come in. So that 50% of the iPhone users, at 10 minutes, we have to go in and say, you can go now, it's OK. But almost all the desktop users come out. And you can see that that's a very clear linear relationship. Now let's talk about this for a minute. How do you sleep? Do you sleep like this? Or do you sleep more like this, right? So this is the sort of general distribution of sleeping positions. And about 40% of people are sleeping in the fetal position. Now, I'm not saying don't snuggle or, you know, do, don't, I mean, spooning is fine, but when you sleep that way all night, is that affecting the way you feel in the morning? That's what we wanted to know. So we don't have a sleep lab, but what we did is we had hundreds of people who we would every morning email and tell us, how did you, what position were you in when you woke up? So they had to choose from all of these images and they could circle how expansive they were. And what we found was that the people whose upper bodies were more expansive, were much less anxious in the morning. Now, obviously, this is bi-directional, right? It's not, you know, if you're less anxious, you're probably more likely to sleep in an open posture. But you also wonder if it's happening in the other direction. So the people who woke up like this were really anxious. They run for their phones, which makes it even worse, because they go immediately and check their email. So this is definitely the winner. So <laughs> now, you can't easily change the way you sleep but you can change what you do before you put your feet on the floor, right? So when you get up, if you're a person who wakes up all clenched up, just unfurl, stretch out, you know, make yourself big, make yourself into a starfish, put yourself in the victory pose before you put your feet on the ground. Just give yourself a couple of minutes to reset. Uh, 
Uh, so last study I want to show you, this is really for the parents and the teachers and all of the people who, who have girls in their lives. So what do we do about this? Obviously, there's a gender difference when you look at adults in how they carry themselves. And you're, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that men use more expansive posture on average than women do. They're more likely to sort of knot themselves up. But kids, before they turn like 11 or 12, boys and girls are doing the same stuff. They're all flailing their arms around and doing cartwheels and not worrying about being all bunched up and small. They get to middle school and all of a sudden, girls start to collapse. You know, you start to see them wrapping themselves up, covering themselves, making themselves small. When is this happening? When are kids learning this? Are we born knowing this? So what we did is we had four-year-olds and six-year-olds look at 16 pairs of these photos. There was always a high power and low power doll. Their task was simple. All they had to do was point to the boy and point to the girl on an iPad. Five years old is the age at which kids start to strongly gender identify. In fact, at that age, they so strongly gender identify that a lot of kids at that age, if you ask them, if you put a boy in a pink dress, would he still be a boy? They'll say no. Right, that's how strongly they gender identify. At four, they're not yet doing that. And at six, they're doing it pretty strongly. So we thought, if, if this is something they're learning, then four-year-olds should show this bias less than six-year-olds. So this is what, what they're looking at, 16 of these pairs. So what we find is that by four years old, 75% show a, a, a bias towards seeing the expansive dolls as boys and the contractive ones at girls. Six-year-olds, 85% show that bias. But this is the more alarming result. At four, 13% have a perfect score, meaning they saw every expansive doll as a boy and every contractive one as a girl. By age six, almost half of them have that bias. Right? So they're learning it before they internalize it. We're, we're, show, we are, we're doing this. Like, this is up to us to change. We're exposing them to these images. How do we change this? You know, so I, I, I just think, I, and this is not just a rhetorical question, I'm putting it to, to you as well. How do we change this? Because once girls start to wrap up like that, it's hard to unfurl them. It's like when you wrap a piece of paper around a pen and then you try to flatten it out, it's very hard to do. So how do we prevent them from closing up? I think that we need to show them images of women and girls carrying themselves with pride and with poise, right? So they don't, like, girls need not think that if you carry yourself in an open way, it's masculine and you've become a boy. And I, I just, you know, here are some, some examples that I certainly love. Um, now this might seem silly, but our daughters love this. And, and the thing is, I'm, I'm actually pleased to see them in these kinds of postures, you know, not making themselves small. Uh, sorry, this is me. It turns out you can hula hoop in a skirt and still be a girl. Uh -huh. This is, this is uh, Sophia Amoruso, who's a young CEO, and I just was very happy to see her in this, this pose on the front of her book. Uh, Supergirl, I was a little bit confused about Supergirl versus Superwoman, but she is strong and holding herself in this confident way. Uh, I hear from a lot of uh, coaches, especially of female teams. This is, this is a, a college swim team, and they're finding it really helpful, especially for female athletes to get them to pose before competition. This is from a dad who started this project where he gets girls to stand like superheroes because uh, he saw his two daughters start to collapse inward as they hit middle school. These are girls who are bullied. So this is a group of middle school age girls who, who deal with bullying every day. And so they're learning to do this before they go into school in the morning. This is really my favorite. Uh, this is Misty Copeland who is the first African-American woman ever to be promoted to principal dancer at American Ballet Theater. And uh, she overcame enormous challenges getting there. She was told, first of all, there's, there's racism in ballet, right? So you have this already. She also was short and she was very muscular. And she was told again and again, you're not built for ballet. You're not built for ballet, you should quit. She just kept on going and obviously she's built for ballet, right? Because <laughs> you don't just accidentally become principal dancer at American Ballet Theater. But what I love about her is, although she does all the classical roles, She's got this beautiful, when you see her, I mean, first she just carries herself with enormous you know, pride and, and poise, but she's got a beautiful Instagram feed where she is always in these 
expansive, beautiful positions that are also so graceful. And here she is in the most feminine profession, but unapologetically powerful. Right? She's not hiding her muscles. She's not trying to make herself small and dainty and frail. So I think we need to show our daughters more of that. So quick takeaways, prepare with big poses in private, because this doesn't go over well <laughs> at all. Uh, present with good, open posture. You know, you don't want to be dominant. You want to be confident and engaging and show people you want to be there and you're interested and mind your posture throughout the day. So you're not going to put your phone down probably, but instead uh, have your phone set a, you know, set a reminder on your phone to check your posture every hour. You know, do things like that or, you know, create a workspace that forces you to reach for things. Get up and have walking meetings. Another thing Bill and I will talk about because Bill's a big fan of walking meetings, aren't you? Yes, so walking meetings are, are really wonderful. Uh, so, so do mind your posture throughout the day because that conversation is constantly happening. And just note that this is a tiny nudge. It slowly, incrementally helps you. It's not a New Year's resolution, which tends to fail because it's way too big and distant and there are a million little steps in between here and there and we give up. This is just a little thing that you can help yourself to feel a little bit co more confident each time and over time, it's really what allows us to be more powerful, more confident, uh, and, and, and much more easily. I'm going to end with a story. This is, these are just a tiny sample of the, the, the pictures that people send to me uh, of, of themselves power posing. This is one that I just got two days ago. Uh, this is a third grader who was really stressed about tests, and she wrote me this note. Uh, Kayatana is out of stress. Thank you for the pose. <laughs> so I, I like that one. Uh, these are young people at a youth homeless shelter uh, who contacted me actually through the, their yoga teacher. And I thought it was great that they even reached out. And I then went and visited them. And I mean, talk about having no social power. These kids have nothing except themselves. Right? So, and they are using this. They are making changes in their lives slowly. By, you know, one of them said just handing an application in at McDonald's, but you know, doing this before I go in so I feel like I deserve this job just as much as anybody else. I might not have a home to live in, but I deserve this job. Uh, these are sixth graders, because we're working on developing a, uh, a video game that gets kids to power pose before math exams uh, to reduce math anxiety and improve math performance. I'll end with this one. This is uh, from a woman named Kathy. That's Kathy. Kathy wrote to me and said, uh, I use your TED talk with my horses. And I was like, I don't, like, do, a big screen, or like, do they watch it? You know, I don't get this at all. And then there's sometimes when I do get some emails where I read the first sentence, I'm like, mm, probably don't go on with this one, right? Like, there's some you're like, I'm going to set that one aside. But this was not a crazy one. She said, I deal with really submissive horses. She, deals, she works with Icelandic ponies, and her job is to bring them out of their shells. They won't interact with other horses. They won't do the... The, the sort of behaviors that horses need to do to feel confident, like rearing and pouncing and playing with each other. So Vafi, this is the name of this horse, would just hide where the fences met. He would just hide there with his nose down. She said it was the hardest case that she'd ever worked, worked on. And she said, I saw your video, and I said, I got to get Vafi to power pose. So I'm like, not sure how this is going to work, you know. But uh, she, she created a giant cat toy. And you can see there's a stick with a string and a ball on the end of it. And for three afternoons, she had Vafi chase that cat toy. So she ran around like this, and Vafi would rear and pounce on the cat toy. So he was basically you know, imitating you know, sort of what dominant horses would do if they were playing with each other. Three afternoons, that's it. Put him back out with the other horses. He became the most dominant horse in the group because his behavior got reinforced by the other horses. But she said to me, she's like, but he's not a jerk. He's a really nice, nice horse. <laughs> she's like, he's still nice, but he's just dominant. But this is Vafi before and after, and you can certainly see the change in his posture. Uh, although I, this is the first competition he went to, and he won this silver medal. And I remember thinking, thank God he's not a human because he'd feel like a loser. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, Vafi's doing quite well. This is Vafi today. And, and I thought, this is wonderful. I love that it worked for this horse. But, you know, it's an N of one, and I'm a psychologist, and I need, to be, I need a, a bigger sample. And she said, OK, just wait. I'll, I'll send you something. I'm, I'm putting something together for you, because Vafi is not the only one. So I'm going to end with this.
she says that this is not, the effects have not yet plateaued. The horses get stronger and stronger. So I like that example because we're animals too, right? A horse can't say, I'm strong, I'm powerful, but his body can tell him that he is, and we work the same way. And I'll leave you with this. Stand up straight, realize who you are, that you tower over your circumstances. And now we will move on to part two. Thank you for listening. Thank you.